Let us pray now. Most holy God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it is Memorial Day weekend, and uh, we want to give thanks to those who have um, given their life in service to um, this country and, and to all of us and for the freedoms that, that we enjoy. I'm thankful that I have not had any uh, personal family members who have um, who have passed away while serving while serving in the military. But, you know, when we think about Memorial Day, we, we also kind of give thanks for, you know, just in general, those who give of their of their lives to that cause. And so I wanted to look up some some photos of of family members that have served, and that includes uh, my grandfathers. And so I want to show you some pic- a picture uh, of my grandfather. This is him in World War uh, II. This is when his name officially became Jack instead of Newton Wade. Uh, he, he, which my middle name is Wade, so a name that doesn't exist anymore is now my middle name. Anyway, so uh, that's Jack Hood. Uh, we, called him, we called him Papa, uh, and he served in, in Europe uh, in the Army as a scout. And this is, uh, this is my, what we call Daddy B. He's, his real name is Martin B. Scott, so this is my, my dad's dad. And he served as a CB in the Navy and, and served uh, in mostly the, the Pacific. And so we give thanks for, um, for all that he contributed as well. And so, uh, so those are my, my two grandfathers who served in, in World War II. And then, like, it just when you start looking at old photos, it sort of makes you nostalgic. I'm, I'm thankful to have these photos because I didn't know them when they were that age, of course. And uh, I get to sort of see what they look like, sort of what, how they were built, what their faces looked like when they were, when they were young and, and, and that sort of thing. And then we get to, and then when they came back from, from the war, they each uh, met and, and got uh, married the, the, the loves of their life. And so this is uh, my, my Pawpaw Jack and... Uh, and this is my nanny. Uh, her name was Vivian. So these are my mom's parents. This is on the day that they uh, got married and are about to go off on, on their honeymoon trip. Uh, they look pretty happy, young and in love. Uh, this is my daddy B, uh, and that is my mama. Uh, her real name is Audrey. And so this is when they are on their honeymoon. So just probably a day or so after uh, they were married. And so uh, they also seem pretty happy and young and in love. And then I just wanted to—I just wanted to keep the role going with young and in love. And so I, I found this par- this picture. This is actually my dad's profile picture. This is my dad and my mom on a couch in in my uh, my nanny's house, I believe, uh, when before they were were married. And I, uh, so I'm not sure how my mom feels about him, like uh, hands and <laughs> in, in the lap. But uh, my dad seems pretty into it, so that's good. Uh, yeah. Uh, but apparently they worked things out because they were able to have three children, uh, and and there we are. So I was a, a little bit of a chubby baby. So that's what's underneath his chin. Like uh, I mean, this this beard is is several more chins. And so we got Sean, and we got uh, my oldest brother Sean and Jason, and 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 then me down there in the little sailor out outfit. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but this is this is the '80s, and you can tell by the the collars. Uh, that it, and the mock turtlenecks, uh, that this, that those might be real turtlenecks. Um, and then as I got a little bit older, I got a little bit of a, sh- a little bit sharper dresser, wearing three-piece suits. Uh, I don't know what this was for. It might have been uh, Easter, I don't know, but I had a great smile, I know that. Um, and then uh, I think all of us three boys at one point wore this Halloween costume. This was our hillbilly costume. Uh, so it's just sort of a floppy hat with like rope suspenders and a flannel shirt. And that's all you need in your hillbilly. Uh, Halloween costumes were a lot more simple then, and they didn't, uh, they didn't cost as much. Uh, this is a picture of, of me and my two brothers, uh, me and my older brother. I was probably seventh or eighth grade here. Uh, that's, my, that's my pop choir uniform. And Jason was in show choir as well in high school. And then Sean was at that age where he couldn't do a full smile because he had to be real cool. Uh, and so he's got that nice soft smile so that all the girls would think he was handsome. It, it never worked. And this is, <laughs> and this is, uh, this is a picture of me in a uh, Kingswood United Methodist Church uh, directory 
that a friend and colleague of mine posted online because he works at a church that our church folded into. And so they had all the old church directories and he was just thumbing through and he found and he found me. Uh, and uh, so this is actually I was pro- I was in college at this time and I, I I'd had the middle part before it was cool, uh, but only in the front, though. I don't. I don't know why I thought that was like a good look, uh, but I wore it for, for many, many years. Uh, and then this is where I get really nostalgic is when uh, my son comes along. And so this is him when he was real, really young, uh, sitting in my lap, uh, and we were just staring at each other. And then he gets a little bit older, and he's even cuter uh, at that age. I think he's got a little bit of sweet potato or, or carrot around his nose there. Uh, but he's still real, real cute. Uh, this is my son, Cade, in his first ever baseball uniform playing for the Braves. That's at my, gran- uh, that's at my parents' house, his grandparents' house, and just as, as happy as he can be. Uh, this is uh, my son and I at my ordination, so he's gotten even a little bit older, and so that was uh, an important moment uh, in our lives. And then this one, uh, this is one of my favorites, and thankfully, or thanks to, to Vivian, it's actually in my office on a nice little wood thing. This is a, this is a picture of, of my son and my mom and my dad's gut at Christmas <laughs> Eve uh, worship uh, in this space. And that's just a really, really special uh, picture to me uh, as they were singing Silent Night together. You know, when you look at old pictures, and I think that we're all guilty, like when we start looking at old pictures, like spending hours doing it, right? Like if I try to clean up my closet and I find an old yearbook, uh, that closet's not getting clean that day, or at least for a couple hours. Because for some reason, I feel the need to look up every single person, even though I've done it plenty of times before and remember what people wrote in my yearbook. When we look at old pictures, we kind of like long for those days again. We give thanks because we get to see like through a window into the past how things were before we we were even around and then those happy memories that we got to experience uh, with our with our families and and our friends. Um, And when I could look at pictures of Kate, it just makes me want to to long for those days to just sort of get back to them when he was that size and, and just make him stay that size and just never leave those moments and we can we feel like we sometimes we never want to let things go let's keep that in mind as we read our scripture for today this is joshua chapter 4 verses 1 through 7 okay this is joshua chapter 4 verses 1 through 7 this is the first book right after the first five books of the of the old testament the hebrew scriptures Uh, The first five books are called the the Pentateuch, and then here comes the book of Joshua. This is what it says. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Pick twelve men from the people, one man per tribe. Command them, pick up twelve stones from right here in the middle of the Jordan, where the feet of the priests had been firmly planted. Bring them across with you and put them down in the camp where you are staying tonight. Joshua called for the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one man per tribe. Joshua said to them, cross over into the middle of the Jordan, up to the Lord your God's chest. Each of you lift up a stone on his shoulder to match the number of the tribes of the Israelites. This will be a symbol among you. In the future, your children may ask, what do these stones mean to you? Then you will tell them that the water of the Jordan was cut off before the Lord's covenant chest. When it crossed over the Jordan, the water of the Jordan was cut off. These stones will be an enduring memorial for the Israelites. Amen. Now, what's happening here is that, see, Joshua was Moses' apprentice. Now, Moses is the fellow who went into Egypt where the Israelites were enslaved and led God's people out of Egypt. And then, if you remember, they were in the desert for 40 years. But before they could escape from Egypt to get into the wilderness, 
they had to cross the Red River or maybe the Sea of Reeds, and, and the waters parted when Moses put his staff down. Remember that? And the waters parted, and they were able to cross, and then the Egyptians that were following were, were drowned in the river. And so God had done this great thing for them as they were promised their own land, the promised land. They were to go into Canaan. But then they were in the desert, the wilderness, for 40 years, and they messed up a little bit. And God had said, nobody from this generation will make it into the promised land. But your, ans- your descendants, those who come after you, will. And so once Moses had died, uh, Joshua took up the mantle of leadership, and then God let them go into the land of Canaan through the river Jordan. And to go have the waters of the, the river parted, they took the Ark of the Covenant, which is the chest that contained the Ten Commandments, which was supposed to be the seat where God sat. That is where the presence of God was. They took that into the middle of the river, and as they did, the waters parted. And then all the people were able to cross the river on dry ground into the promised land. And once they had gotten over to the other side, God told Joshua to send 12 men, one from each tribe of Israel, because there were 12 tribes, back into the river to pick up a stone from where the chest was and take it to the other side, to the encampment on the other side of the river. And there they stacked the stones so that it would be a memorial for God's faithfulness and what had happened and how God had brought them out of Egypt into the promised land. Now, their work wasn't over, but this was a memorial for a long time, so that when they, the children asked, why do y'all look up to these stones so much? What do these stones mean? And they would be able to tell them how faithful God was to them in that moment. They placed them there so that people could remember. Uh, Reverend Reverend Christy Robbins, one of my uh, colleagues here, an associate pastor along with myself here at Arborline, is on vacation this week. So she took the beginning of summer to begin her summer vacation. So her and her family are uh, going through some national parks. They're going to go to the Grand Tetons. They're going to go to Yellowstone. I think there was there was one others. And so when she's in these national parks, she might come across a stack of stones that looks kind of like this. This is, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, this is a cairn, okay? A cairn, which is a stack of stones, and this is comes from a Scottish, a Gaelic word. And back in the old days, they would stack stones either where maybe someone was buried, but also as markers for people who were navigating. In fact, before there were, uh, there were uh, lighthouses, they would stack stones real up high at the, at the edges of, of the island so that when ships would be able to come, they would know where the land was and also be able to use it for, for navigation. But we've also used them for trails in national parks and in other areas so that when the trail is confusing, that you might be able to have a stack of stones to know where to go. So those who have gone before you have created a stack of stones so that you also know the direction to go. Uh, It's become sort of a problem because you've probably gone to places and you see hundreds of these stacks of stones, right? And now there's a campaign to tell people, stop stacking stones. Stop making your own cairns because it makes the cairns that actually have a purpose uh, obsolete. And then some people will take stones off the official cairns to make their own because they're the best rocks, right? But also when they move all the rocks around, it messes up the whole thing, right? But these cairns that are the original ones exist to help people know where to go. So they place them there so that others can learn from their work and enjoying their own hike safely. I wonder how weird it would have been if the Israelites had told their children when they asked, what do these stones mean? When they asked, told them what happened. And so then they decided to stay there and just keep crossing the river over and over again. This is what this means, right? This is what God did in this moment. And so let's keep doing that right? Let's just take the chest back out in the middle of the river and let's just keep crossing it because that's what our our forefathers, our ancestors did. Let's just keep doing that. That would be really, really weird. No, the purpose of them telling the story, the purpose of them helping them understand what these stones mean is so that they could give thanks to God for God's faithfulness. 
and remember what their ancestors had done to give them the life they now have. To remember and then live for today. When we look at old photos, it makes sense that we might want to go back to that time uh, and to stay there. But sometimes when we go to photos and remember the old times, sometimes we dwell a little too long. I could spend all day looking at photos of Cain. I don't get tired of it. You think you would, but you'd, I don't get tired of it. I find an old video of him doing something cute, and I just want to watch it over and over and over again. I just don't get tired of it. But the danger is that the longer I linger there, the longer I long for those days gone by, the less likely I am able to appreciate who Cade is now and help him to live into who he's, who he's going to be and to love him in the moment. Because all I can focus on is what was. Jesus Christ says that he came that we might have life and live it to the fullest. Fullest. In fact, Christ lived, died, and was resurrected because God, through Christ, loved us so much. And that life, that death, that resurrection, that gives us the freedom to live more fully today. And the best way to remember the love of Christ is to live in love more fully now. Not to just understand everything that Christ did, but if you have a full understanding and you have a full appreciation, then you live more fully now. In the same way, those who died in battle and service to our country have done so because they believed it would help us live freely. And the best way to remember them is to enjoy that freedom. As we make our way out of this pandemic, as individuals, as, as families, as, as a community, as a rooted community, we may long for the way things were a little bit. Uh, now, this is a little different. I kind of wish the way, that, like that we used to do it. Oh, this is where so-and-so used to sit, but I guess they've, they've moved on. And I just, oh, those were the days when I could have had that time. I wish I could go back there. I, we long for... The, n- the normal, or the normal, the way things used to be. But when we look on the past, let us not do with so with a longing to return to it, but with thanks. We, give, we remember and we give thanks for what was. And we give thanks that what was helped us to get to this point. And we remember and we honor those times and we build on it. Because our, what we're living into will not look exactly the same as it did before. Even though we brought back offering baskets today, we brought back the candlelight, and we brought back coffee, it feels a little bit more normal, but it's never going to be exactly as it was. And that's good. Because what is and what is to come can even be better. God's faithfulness is not going to end. Just because God was faithful then doesn't mean that God can't be faithful anymore. God's faithfulness never ends. And so God will lead us into this new thing. And so let us not be stuck on the past. Let us, we can look back, we can appreciate, we can give thanks, we can honor it. But also realize that the past exists so that we can live today. And so that we can create a new and better future for tomorrow. We have been given life by God and by those who have gone on before us. Let us remember them and give thanks, and then let us honor them by truly living. Amen. We come now to a time where, well, we remember. We remember the the life that that Christ lived and and how he died for us, and then how he, he was resurrected once again for us. And we appreciate all that was, and we remember it well, but we remember it so that Christ might fully, more fully live in us and so that we might love more fully today. So the night that he gave himself up, Christ was sitting around a table with his friends, and he gave thanks over the bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you eat this, I want you to remember me and the life that I lived. 
Then he took the cup, gave thanks over it, and blessed it, and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, I want you to remember me and the life that I live. And so we do that today. We remember the life of Christ, and we pray that these items not become for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Amen. Uh, I want to remind you that this table does not belong to Arbelon or Rooted or even the United Methodist Church. This table belongs to God. And that means that all who are seeking a relationship with God are welcome at this table. All who simply want to experience the grace of God this morning are welcome at this table, regardless of who you are or where you're from or what you have done. You are welcome with us today. Uh, if you have your own uh, uh, communion cup with you this morning, if you're in person, the, the top layer gives you access to the, the wafer, and there's a thicker layer that gives you access to the juice. If you are at home this morning and you're worshiping with us, I hope that you have bread and juice or some other substitutes. And if you're with others, you might offer that to them and say, this is the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, or simply that Jesus loves you. And if you are worshiping with us alone today, know that you're not truly alone, that you're connected to us and to all the body of Christ everywhere through Christ's love and Christ's spirit. And so we love you this morning. We give thanks that you decided to worship with us. As we approach the table today, uh, we want to do so with humble hearts. So we, one way we can do that uh, is that we can pray a prayer of confession so that God may be able to shape us into who God created us to be. Won't you join me in a prayer of confession? God of grace and mercy, at times we are guilty of not remembering the past. We forget how faithful you have been and the great things you have done. At other times, we are guilty of living in the past as we long to return to the way things were. Both keep us from living fully in the present and loving fully those you have given us. Forgive us. As we come to your table today, we remember the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is good for us to remember. We give you thanks for your great love for us. As we leave your table today, let your spirit live in us so that we might live in love more fully today. Lord, in your mercy, amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the blood of Christ, shed for you.